G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle, and in today's episode, I've come up with a bit of a chart. So it's my pyramid guide to understanding and assessing power levels. So this stems off of the fact that, you know, people have asked me about the methodology behind how I rank and assess different legions. So let's get into that, the, the why. Well, I recently started this new series where I talk a lot about the topic of legion strengths and weaknesses and how to compare them. And I realized that there isn't really a codified process or procedure for assessing this, only an unwritten system within everyone's individual head. And I decided to therefore try and create a system that's easy to understand. And well, if it works correctly, you can replicate my thought process because remember, I'm far from always being right but I at least try to explain my position and this is no different. So in order to do this, I've constructed a pyramid chart. I call it that because I've sliced up the subject into the layers of the pyramid with the most easily understandable concepts being the bottom or the foundation and the more nebulous concepts being the top. Every layer builds upon everything that came before it. So maybe if people respond positively enough to this series, I'll codify this and I might even turn it into a free ebook or something and we can call it maybe tabletop list building theory or such. Anyway, let's start with tier four, the basic cost. So the most obvious thing here is the cost or points of a unit. Higher points, for example, in Games Workshop means that there must be a corresponding performance boost. And if not, the unit or the weapon, the war gear item, will be less desirable. I have placed points first as they factor into all the other tiers in some way. So rather than being anything beyond what it is, it is really just the basic, most important foundation that everything else builds upon in this pyramid. So that's what I found most interesting about this. So in here, for example, we have the Emperor's Children's Sun Killer Squad, and it's just in there because it's an interesting unit with very expensive points, and then for some reason downgrading from the excellent las cannons they come with to arguably worse weapons like the Plasma Cannon somehow costs the same amount of points. It just immediately stands out to you. Uh, but more on that in a moment because here we have the raw stat lines. So this is tier three. Now, this is the next most obvious place to start with. When you look at stats, strictly speaking, the higher the number in every stat, except for the save or the armor penetration value, the better. The way this works is simple, okay? So in an example, you could have something like two models with identical stats and zero war gear. But if one model has a better weapon skill, well, a higher weapon skill is generally going to be the superior model. However, then points have to factor into this. So the points of the first tier of the pyramid, we're one level up. We now combine the two concepts together. The stat boost must be worth something as it is a stat increase. If a unit performs better, it can be adjusted for in a perfect world. However, we live in an imperfect world and I'll try and demonstrate why. So let's pretend we have two different weapons. Weapon A fires one shot and weapon B identical stats, but can fire two shots. Do you charge twice as much for weapon B? It's twice as powerful, right? If the model using it is still the same, will it double the performance of that model? If not, then you have to look at the changing points as weapon B won't be taken if it's too expensive. These are the sort of trade-offs on raw stats meeting points that you have to keep in mind. You can pay more for a boost, but at some point, the boost is worth less than simply buying more of something else in its place. A great example of this could be the Legion Spatha attack bike versus the Scimitar jet bike. Whilst the Spatha does offer other weaponry, it is handily beaten on many stats, but worse than this, it costs more points, rendering it unusable. Then we come into tier two. So tier two, we're starting to get very high up the pyramid now. This is special rules. 
So the second tier of the pyramid is the special rules of a unit. The raw rules which amplify the performance of the raw stat lines. So this is why it's so high up, because it changes everything that came before it. Now a unit may have equal points and stats with another unit, but if one has a built-in boost, it becomes superior. For example, an Imperial Fist Space Marine with a bolt gun gets a bonus to hit with his weapon of plus one at all times, granting a 16% damage output boost with his main offensive weapon. A Sons of Horror Space Marine has no such boost, fundamentally making him weaker for the same points. However, he has his own boost, which applies in other circumstances and may be extremely useful. So how do you then weigh these two against one another and decide which is the better unit? Well, typically the best way to judge is to then look at the likelihood of their ability triggering successfully. How often will the ability go off? Is it once per game? Is it every turn? Is it multiple times a turn? Then there is the question of worth. An ability which is situational almost never is applicable. Uh, well, that's going to be worth far less than ability which is always in demand. The points should also reflect this. Another factor to consider is when a unit has many special rules. Many does not always equal better, and can sometimes lead to a word soup that ultimately culminates in a unit which performs worse. My example for this would be the Red Butchers of the World Eaters Legion, who in their description come across as a group of savage madmen who can carve through any unit and have a workable stat line of war gear. They fall apart when it comes to special rules and points as you quickly work out that they're actually reduced in effectiveness versus contemporaries thanks to the poor special rules assigned to them. A particularly powerful sort of special rule, such as Shock Pulse, which can negate hundreds of points of Titan, being able to perform an action during the turn is also weighted much more favourably, provided that it passes the test of repeatability and ease of use. Now we're getting to the top of the pyramid, Tier 1, Synergistic Stacking. So this is a much harder one to explain, but I'm going to try. Synergistic stacking is when you take otherwise innocuous and correctly adjusted rules and units, and then through list creation, rules, or proximity, you amplify them beyond their original purpose. So, as long as this is accounted for, it works fine. For example, a Master of Signals, a common console available to all the legions, grants plus one ballistic skill to a friendly unit within six inches in lieu of shooting. His special rule boosts another unit, making them stronger, but it's paid for within his rules, and there is no unit in the game where his ability makes them incredibly overpowered. Where this becomes difficult to assess is when the boost granted is amplified out of proportion by the boosted unit. For example, the Warmonger console. If he was to deep strike in with some Legion Terminators or a Veteran Squad, it would be strong, but it would be pretty fair for his cost. But then, what if it was a Primarch and 10 Terminators? A unit which would normally require a very expensive transport to cross the table, so he's worth far more to you now because he's saving you points elsewhere. Uh, and if he teleports in with 5 Terminators or 10, that dramatically changes how much you've paid for the Warmonger, his ability is worth twice as much now because it transported in twice as many models, and a high threat unit at that. The points he costs are better spread amongst the larger squad, and the synergy gets the unit, uh, which could have been shot to death into the enemy zone far quicker than by other means. Another type of synergy stacking uh, is where you're stacking multiple things, most famously is the Phalanx Waters. The Stone Gauntlet Right of War changes their slot on the Forsook chart, and it adds abilities to the Phalanx Warders. If they take Apothecaries, they can get a Feel No Pain, which will be boosted, of course, by all those special rules that you're seeing on screen in red. Um, 
if they're on an objective and they get further boosts as well from having that right of war. So again, all the stuff in red. Uh, and then if you take Fafnir Ran, his warlord trait is going to add all the extra boost in green. So you've taken the unit, which costs exactly the same points from its core starting point on the left of the screen and by the time you get to the right side of the screen you've added many many special rules and added an incredible amount of survivability to the unit that has just not been factored into the cost. Then we get to the apex or the anti-synergy. So this is the top part of the pyramid and it's the top because it's the most nebulous, the hardest one to actually spot out in the wild. So it's the least likely for people to understand it, to get their head around it and say, okay, I get exactly why this is an issue. So because of this, it's hard to explain. You might have a unit that's, it presents itself as amazing, okay, by all of the previous metrics. It's a good price, it has great stats, it has good war gear, good special rules, but somehow it fails at synergy. And the perfect example, I think, is the Raven Guard Deliverers, the Terminator unit. So the Raven Guard Deliverers are a fantastic unit, okay? It's got all of those things I mentioned previously, good special rules, good war gear, but they don't work within their legion. There's another very similar unit in the game, the Huskulls of the Imperial Fists. So let's use the two as side-by-side -side comparisons. First and foremost, they're both Terminator units with the ability to Deep Strike. They have increased survivability with Battle Hardened or a boosted save. However, the Huskulls, they can be joined by other Terminators, and those other units can also take similar war gear such as Storm Shields, and they can also Deep Strike because they're Imperial Fists, meaning that they can have squads that are almost the equivalent of Huskulls. Further, they make an excellent bodyguard for their Primarch. Deliverers, on the other hand, well, there are no other Terminators in the Raven Guard that can Deep Strike, and you can only take a single unit of Deliverers, so they're on their own. They cannot benefit from any survivability boost comparable to that of Storm Shields. Deliverers also cannot join their Primarch at all, so far from being an ideal bodyguard unit, they actually work well, well, against that concept by design. So when placed side by side, the Huskulls synergize in nicely with their role, but the Deliverers are simply an excellent unit, but who is on their own within the Raven Guard, and because they don't mix in well with the Raven Guard rules, they actually would probably work as well, if not better, in literally any other Legion. This is an example of anti-synergy. Lastly, we have... Tier X, the company. So this is a slide that is unique to Games Workshop. The final tier is the great unknown. What will Games Workshop do to the faction? If they look after you, when they FAQ you, will it be the sun? Will it be a rain cloud? Are they gonna rain on your parade? Or are they gonna smile upon you? You just don't know. And this thunderstorm is ever present around our pyramid. Although, not what you would expect in other game systems, it is applicable here. So, to sum back up on this, every slice in this pyramid builds upon the one before it. You can't have synergy without special rules. You can't have special rules without a stat line to go with it, and that stat line has to be worth some points. And you can't judge an asymmetry, and anti-synergy, until you have gone through every one of those previous steps to get to it. And that's what makes it the hardest of all to work out. Anyway, that's it from me. I'm Mac with the Outer Circle. Thank you for watching this rather short and sharp episode, but I really do hope you got something out of this episode. If you did, please leave thoughts and comments below. And if you think I got something wrong in the way I assess things, well, leave that in the comments below as well, uh, because those sort of comments always intrigue me. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all on the next episode.